everybody doing tonight, all right? How's everybody doing tonight, all right? How's everybody doing tonight? Emeril Lagasse here. Tonight, we're gonna be cooking with flour power. How does that sound to you guys? What did you say? Flour power? We're talking about baking. We're gonna do some baking. We're gonna do some cooking techniques with flour. Hopefully, get a little bit more educated about that. First, I'm gonna show you how to do a very kicked up from scratch pita bread with duck stuffed pita sandwiches. And as my good friend says, are you Catholic and can you make a roux? We're gonna show you how to do that and make a little chowder of love. Chowder of love. <laughs> hey, relax, don't touch that dial, don't be surfing there. What do you think the other late night shows are doing, huh? And to kick it up a notch, orange petty fours with almond pastry cream and a fresh orange glaze. <laughs> so if you guys are ready, I am, because we're gonna get started about flour right here on Emerald Live. <laughs> Give it up for Doc Gibbs and Cliff, everybody. How you doing? How are you? Yep, I'm well. Give it up for Jay Leno's dad, everybody. <laughs> no, he's my dad. Sorry, okay. <laughs> All right. Flour. Unbelievable. So complicated, yet so easy. How are you? You know, most flowers are wheat. Pretty basic, I think we learned that somewhere along the line. You know, these wheat things. But then after they uh, get processed, they start going in a lot of different categories. First one being right here, I think I'm gonna do the uh, school teacher approach tonight. <laughs> and this one here. This is wheat flour right here, so it's not quite as processed, it's a lot more dense. Then we have all-purpose flour. We have cake flour. We have self-rising flour. You know why they have self-rising flour these days? Mostly for biscuits and to eliminate, like particularly with uh, bread making, if uh, you're using and making bread, it's pretty simple. When you add flour to water, it begins to get gluten. It has a gluten, which I'm going to show you all in a little bit. And then the gluten traps the carbon dioxide in conjunction with the yeast makes the bread expand. Sound good, huh? <laughs> Basically it gets poofy, is what I say. <laughs> it's the easy way. Self-rising flour a lot for like biscuits these days. Quick, they rise quick, bake them quick. And we take for granted how many ingredients, not just in bake bakery items, not just in bread, how many items really affect our lives with flour? It's unbelievable. When we come back, I'm going to show you how to make a wheat pita bread that will knock your socks off, that you can use anytime, anywhere. But first, Doc Gibbs and Cliff, everybody. Cliff. Oh. 
So you got a new hat up there, Doc? Yeah, a couple firemen in the house. Oh, man, we know we're safe then. Good. Yeah, oh, yeah. We are, if you're just joining us, talking about bread, the introduction of bread. We just kind of reviewed a few flowers, the different flowers of all-purpose flour versus cake flour, cake flour versus bread flour, and, of course, bread flour and wheat flour, where it all starts before the bran is really stripped from there. Nice little baby strainer. <laughs> if you want to sift your flour like that, there are some breads that you make, and before you make them, you need to do a step that's called making a sponge. A lot of you probably have heard that term, making bread. It's nothing to be afraid of. Basically, I'm going to show you first how to make this sponge with whole wheat. We take warm water, which is what you should use to dissolve the yeast in when you're making bread. The water should not exceed 105-ish degrees or you'll kill the yeast. So although you want to make sure that the water is warm so that it expedites the process, you don't want it to be over 105 degrees or <laughs> you have dead flour. <laughs> then, one package of that yeast. The other thing that I encourage people to do, and I can see a lot of guilty faces out there, you have to look at the expiration date on the back of the package of your yeast. Especially a lot of you closet bammers out there <laughs> that, you know, only bring out the yeast like once a year. You have to check the expiration date. Then, you want to dissolve the yeast in the warm water. Once you do that, a little pinch of salt, then what we're going to do is begin to start adding our whole wheat flour a little at a time. You can do this on a machine as well until it forms a sponge. What do I mean by that? Well, you're going to see in a second. Unlike if we were making this first into a dough, instead of a sponge. We would basically be looking for this to come off the sides of the bowl and form a ball. Possibly the reason why we're having a sponge is because whole wheat flour is a lot more dense than, say, bread flour, where bread flour has a lot more gluten because of how it's processed. So part of the reason of the sponge, once this is all incorporated and it sits, the longer it sits, the better. You can make this sponge, keep it in the refrigerator, keep it out, actually, and look what it does. It like kind of gets like foamy, you see? Now, see? Ooh. Oh. We got the sponge. Now, we're going to take the sponge, turn it into a dough to make pita bread. Watch how simple. Something about that. I always taste to see if it's sugar or salt. I've been fooled many times. <laughs> big, big victim right there. Huge victim. So now we're going to add a little salt. We're going to add a little oil. And then what we're going to do is we're going to start working in our flour, a little at a time, regular bread flour, or it could be all-purpose flour. And we're going to make our dough. So, once we get all of this flour incorporated into our sponge, we'll now have this whole wheat dough. What I like to do is take the bigger glass bowl, when I incorporate all the flour, I take a little bit of oil in the bowl. 
And then what I do is kind of just coat the bowl with this because I'm actually going to proof the dough in this bowl. When you're proofing dough, you don't want to do it where there's a draft. You don't want to put it like right on the burner, like but like above the stove or somewhere warm, and that will also expedite the proofing part of that. Now, after it proofs, this is what it looks like. See, it's poofy now. Now, this recipe, this dough recipe right here, we've got to start working it. I love that. Let's work it, baby. <laughs> we're going to cut this in half. Each one of these halves should make about eight, depending on size, pita breads depending on size. So now that we got the dough cut in half, we're going to take whole wheat flour, since it's a whole wheat dough. We're going to take our half like this. What we're going to do is we're going to start working it, baby. This was an old Little League baseball bat I had. <laughs> My friends at Maplewood Park. So what we're going to do is we're going to cut these. Now, that would be a very large pita bread. You could probably feed a family. <laughs> so you got to like think about what size pita bread that you want, what you're using it for. Is it for a sandwich? Is it for like a block party? You know, perhaps maybe a community event like the whole church. <laughs> so once you come up with that, then you can decide how big you want to make these. And you roll them out about so thin. That's about the perfect size, well, at least for me. That will make a nice sandwich. Now, they sell these at these stores now. They sell these baking bricks. Hey, when I was a kid, there were no baking bricks. You either had bricks or nothing. <laughs> so, if you want to go buy a baking brick, go ahead. That's fine. I got it myself. But you can do this with just getting some bricks in the neighborhood, sanitizing them, working, you know what I'm saying. All right. Now, I've got my baking brick in here, and I got this on about 450, 470 degrees. Can we see this fancy brick, Houston? It's a beautiful brick. Look, see? It's even smiling right now. <laughs> what we're going to do is we're going to take our pita dough and we're going to place it right here on our bricks. This will go about two at a time. The one I got at home is square but what's going to happen, that's a perfect thing because of the even temperature to do pizza, pizza dough, pita bread. You can do it on a grill. Maybe I should show you one of those anyhow. Well I'll show you that when we come back. I'll show you one how to do it on the grill and then I'll show you how to stuff it with some duck to blow your mind. Stick around. Hey, hey, welcome back. For some reason, if you fell off like another planet, that was Doc Gibbs and Cliff, everybody. And we're on Emerald Live. All right. You better believe it. So everybody's with me on the pita bread so far, right? I haven't lost anybody on Broadway. Very simple. We did the sponge, made it into a dough. We rolled them out, little discs. Fancy brick uh, oven in there, stone oven, right? Okay, I just want to make sure we didn't lose anybody. Watch what happens with these pita breads. See, this is what the sponge does. Check it out. See how poofy they are? You see? And what you do is you flip them over. Look at that. We got a little color on there. 
You see? That's why that beautiful even heat like that. Oh, I'm so happy right now. I could jump right inside there. Now, you're in a pinch. You don't have like one of those stones. I've done these on the grill before, like on a barbecue grill. You just gotta tame your heat down. You can do them like on this kind of grill too. I'm just gonna turn the heat down a little bit because we don't wanna burn them. We're just trying to cook them. Let's check it out. Sometimes I do these like this at the restaurant and on the fly because uh, you smell that? Kind of it's got that little charcoal smell going on. I love that. I love when that happens. See, look, poofing is going on right now. Oh, yeah, look, we're talking poofing. But I was making a joke earlier about that, of that little, uh, I'm going to turn the heat down a little bit. Yeah, you can do that. <laughs> yeah, that's what these things are for, you see? <laughs> I just went from medium high down to low. <laughs> see, that's your brain on Emerald Live. <laughs> Now, let's turn it over. I love that. Looks like a chicken walked on it. <laughs> Roadrunner. But you can cook them like this, okay? You can cook them on the grill. You will get a little bit more direct heat. You smell that? That's the, ca the carbon dioxide going. Guest spot on the Sopranos. <laughs> but a regular grill, you'll get a little bit more. Let's go back, Houston. Let's go back and check out what's happening here. Oh! All we need is one of those pizza paddles right now. But I gotta, I'm okay with that. I can use my hand. I'm a big guy. Whew. Look at that. Doesn't that look unbelievable? Oh. Give me a break in life. <laughs> All right, we're going to go back here now. Take this one out. You look at the size of this one. So, that's how simple, folks, you can do this whole wheat pita bread like this. Now, you're going to want to let them cool down a little bit. Forget about it. <laughs> Try this one here. You're going to want to let them cool a little bit because there's a lot of hot air inside of there right now. Doc, let me put you on one. Oh, yeah. Doc, do you have one of these stones? Uh, I used to. I got rid of it. It, it broke. That happens. Yeah. I thought maybe you used it as part of the, the, the old trap set you had over there. <laughs> okay, look, folks. Here's what we're now going to do. I got some uh, brie cheese. Love brie cheese. Hey, maybe you want Ipois, maybe you want Santiago, whatever kind of cheese you like. Use a melting type of cheese, okay? But, I got some duck home feet. Don't be afraid. <laughs> you can buy this stuff now, too, if you don't want to make it. We've made it a bunch of times. Take the skin out, the meat comes. Basically, it's been slow cooked and it's fat. Do you, do you eat meat? Try that. They, they think I'm lying, these folks. <laughs> and it's cooked. Isn't that delicious? Mm -hmm. Cooked slowly. <laughs> it's cooked slowly like this, and it's fat. And then after it cools, you take this off. Beautiful thing that you can do with this. That's what we did here. We took all the duck meat off. Now, if it's okay with you guys, I'm going to add about 40 cloves of garlic right inside of there. <laughs> I'm going to add a little bit of parsley, a couple of three shallots. If you don't have shallots hand diced, you can just use some red onion. And then the option is you can either use a little butter or duck fat. Use a little duck fat.
You know, you should have seen when I was coming here with that stuff on the subway today. <laughs> I had it in a beaker bottle, you know? Guy across from me, he's looking at my duck fat like, that's a pretty good beaker you got, you know? So, if you want to kick it up a couple of notches, you can always bring out a little cognac. You don't want to overkill it. Let's be fair. We'll use some butter, too. How's that? That's it. Now, watch this stuff. You take it down. What we're actually doing now is making like a rillette. We add a confit of duck into a rillette. I'll explain later. Relax. <laughs> Basically, what you want to know is that this is good. Taste it for seasoning. That's when your brain goes, self! Of course, for me, it's more pepper. Bam, bam. <laughs> Certainly a little more duck fat. Hey, I risked my life today with this. <laughs> we'll scrape it on down right here. Make sure it's all incorporated. Now, watch this. See, the guys in the kitchen over there, Felicia, Jill, they're just waiting for this to be done. <laughs> now, we don't want to make it like a puree. Check it out. Watch this. Here's what we like to do right here. Voila! Voila! Watch this. You make like a little smiley face inside of your pita bread like this. See? Then you open it up like a clamshell. What I like to do is take a couple of pieces of brie cheese like that. Then, take some of that duck. See, you can see it. Watch. You may not see this at home. It's going, feed me. <laughs> you just put it right in there. Hey, you want lettuce, bean sprouts, you know all the rules. What you then want to do is put it back in here so that you can melt that brie cheese a little bit and it gets all gooey on that duck stuff and together, woo! Let me tell you, baby. Coming up, chowder of love. Stick around. Gibbs and Cliff, welcome back, everybody. All right. Before I show you my next, uh, my next dish, chowder. Yeah, flour is used in that. I'm just really impressed on mine staying up so poofy. Doesn't that look poofy? I'm going to show you a quick little. Oh. These look fantastic. Cheese is all melt. See you, can we get that? Look at the, look at the shot, Nick. Can, look at that. Oh my God! <laughs> Here's what we like to do. You take them. You can either use apple, use a little pear. What I like to do right at the end you can either do them inside, you could do it over it, put some inside like this, because the pear with that duck and the brie, to die for. There you go. 
Now, you two ladies, I'm not picking on you. <laughs> Even though you're absolutely beautiful. Oh, thank you. Thank you. No, these guys drove all the way from Tennessee to come to the show tonight. I'm not kidding. <laughs> Here you go, ladies. Oh, thank you. I know, I know, man. I was getting to you. Getting to you. I'm trying to get to the females first. I'm working it, baby. I'm working it. All right, you got it. You're next. Now, I want to show you this chowder of love. I got a big knife here if you need it, ladies. Yeah. You do? Here, try this one right here. Be careful, though. It's got my name on it. Okay. okay. <laughs> See, in New York, they steal things like that. You know? We won't steal. <laughs> now, I started with some leeks instead of onion. Carrots. Some beautiful bacon. You know, bacon is back. I'm telling you, recently New York Times again, all these newspaper articles I'm reading, bacon is back. It's like... It's like... Where you been? Bacon is back. It's like, where you been, man? <laughs> Read the shirt. Pork fat rules. <laughs> So I got some really beautiful hickory smoked bacon. I'm cooking that in there. You could use a little onion, okay? You see? We're going to get that tender. I love this. And this is perfect for any kind of chowder. Start with this beginning right here. You could turn it into corn chowder. You could turn it into corn chowder of love. You could turn it into corn chowder. Oh, I said that. It's like that shrimp guy. I'm making clam chowder of love tonight. You could add tomato, make it Manhattan. You could add just more potatoes, make it potato leek. Chowders are so versatile. They're like gumbo. But smell that? It's the bacon, I'm telling you. All right. Here's what we're going to do. When you get it nice and tender like this, you want to take some all-purpose flour. And then what you're going to do is you're going to make a roux with the flour. Why? Because that's what's going to thicken it. And that's what, I'm telling you, I can't believe how many people have flipped out about making roux. Look, it's just flour. You want to cook it for about two or three minutes, folks. Let it cook. Let it get happy. Let it have a good time with that bacon. Yeah. Then, then what you're going to do is this. You can buy clam juice. You can steam your own and use the clam juice. What you want to do, we're going to add this first. You see, a roux, like any thickening agent, is never going to be at its full thickening power until it comes to a boil. Just remember that. Whether it's cornstarch, arrowroot. So we're going to start right now with that. Let it come to a boil. Then what we're going to do is we're going to add cream. You could add milk. You could add half and half. Hey, don't add any if you're like allergic to it. Leave it just clam juice. We're going to add some of that in there now. Get it nice and creamy with that bacon. Once we add the milk or the cream, we're going to add diced potatoes because the diced potatoes, and look, I don't like just like a couple of strands of potatoes. You know, you get those chowders, you get like one or two lumps of potatoes and like one little piece of clam. I'm like, I feel ripped off when that happens. It's like, oh, they saw this guy walking in. So the potato has also got starch in it. Yeah, yeah. It's going to give off that starch. It's going to also thicken it. Then we we'll flavor it with a little thyme, or you don't have to. 
a couple of bay leaves. You don't have to. A little salt. <laughs> Wake up out there, folks. <laughs> Guy down the street's got a lot of empty seats. <laughs> All right, now, here's the deal. You let it simmer 45 minutes. Check it out. See that? Oh, yeah. If you want to cream it a little more, now we're going to add the clams in there, the chopped clams. We're going to add a little bit more of that clam juice that I had, the clams. And then we'll take a vote when we come back of whether we should cream it or not. And then I've got some unbelievable orange petty fours. Stick around. We'll be right back. <laughs> Happy, happy, little chowder, up to your standards? It's good, huh? The bacon is, I'm telling you, and the little simple roux like that, you gotta cook it out. You guys are okay with the chowder over there? Beautiful thing, beautiful thing. All right, check this out. We're gonna make this little petty for us with this orange cake, but you don't have to just use this recipe to just make orange uh, petty for us. You can make it for birthday cake, any kind of cake that you want, Saturday cake, Monday cake, etc. We'll start with a little sugar like this and a little mixer. And the first technique is to actually cream butter and sugar because we're making a batter. So what we're going to do is we're going to, the butter should also be soft. So we're going to just put it on slow. And we're going to begin to start letting that butter and the sugar do this creaming. It's a creaming thing. Then, I got eggs. It's an orange cake, so I have a good zest of like a whole orange. And just the zest. Hey, you want a lemon cake? Use lemon. You want a grapefruit cake? Use grapefruit. Little vanilla. And... You can use milk, you could use half and half. You could use buttermilk, which would make it even a little more richer. And then of course we're using cake flour since we're making a cake. And you wanna be sure when you're using flours like this that you sift them properly. Because if you don't sift them, you see I'm sifting them on the paper like this. If you don't sift them, I got baking powder as well little bit of salt and you want to be able to sift them just to make sure that it's really fine we're actually aerating this right here but look you see what happens if you don't sift it God knows what's in there <laughs> that one of the kids matchbox cars could be in there or something so don't take a chance now you tough guys out there that are doing some like heavy duty baking. Hey, we got you covered too. If you need to do some extra straining, okay? If you need to do some extra straining. <coughs> put that flour in there. That's in case you're on one of those community service projects, you know what I'm saying? You gotta kick up the flour a little bit. Doc, you're not going to believe we found this. I think I can use it. <laughs> God knows where what, but just leave it there for a couple of shows. No problem. Now, you see here, folks, the butter and the sugar have creamed. Now what we're going to do is we're going to add the eggs, one egg at a time. Let it incorporate one egg at a time.
We're gonna add the vanilla. You know, there are other flavors too. You just don't have to use vanilla. There's peppermint oil, orange oil, ginger oil. They have all of these nice natural flavor. I love orange though. I'm gonna add the orange peel in here so that it can all incorporate. I'm gonna add our liquid, our milk. Now, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm not gonna add all the milk right now because once I got all of that incorporated, what I'm gonna do is knock the machine off, get a little plastic spatula, and you wanna be sure to scrape the sides down. Can you see that? Because if not, you're gonna have all of these like particles and stuff that weren't really incorporated. You wanna get the bottom of that too. Then generally while I'm at it, I'll just take our sifted flour Nice and neat. Kind of add that right in there. And then you can save this paper, cut it in half, take your sheet pan, put it on there, and also butter it. Because this is a pretty moist cake, and you want this cake to come out. Now what we're going to do is we're going to incorporate slowly the flour and the rest of our liquid into this cake batter. At this point you want to go set the uh, preset the oven about 370 degrees, 360 degrees, 350 degrees if you think your oven's not calibrated. You know, we all have crazy ovens like that every now and then. See how simple this is? We get that nice cake batter going right now. We're going to take that cake batter, pour it on our buttered and parchment sheet pan, and then we're going to bake it in the oven. When we come back, I'm going to show you how to finish this incredible Petty Ford dessert. Stick around! <laughs> everybody and uh, what we're gonna do before I uh, close this out here I wanted to show you a couple of little tricks you know we made that cake batter you want to make sure all your ingredients are room temperature including the butter that I said when you're creaming it with the sugar and the milk because if the butter is not and it's cold it's gonna take a while before it creams with the sugar but then if you go and add cold milk on top of that it's gonna congeal too so you uh, you, you want to be careful that you don't do that it'll look separated We'll pour that batter in there nice and fluffy like that. Then as I said, we're gonna bake that for about 20, 25 minutes. And when it comes out, you're gonna chill that down. And now you have the basis for, to make your cake or to make your petty fours. You can do them smaller, you can do them bigger. What I've done here is I've taken a little bit of orange juice with a pastry brush, a little concentrate of it. And I basically, as an orange syrup, just want to add a little bit more orange flavor into the cake. Then I have an orange pastry cream, buttercream, sugar, little orange peel. Going to put that on top and form these little squares, just single squares. Now I'm going to add orange juice with confectionery sugar and a little bit of milk so that I can make sort of this little orange fondant or this orange glaze, if you will. You know, like when you go buy glazed donuts, except this one's going to have orange juice in it. So we've got a lot of orange concentration right now. Now, very simple to make that icing. See, I did two layers. Took a layer, did a layer of the uh, buttercream, another layer of the cake. Then what you want to do is you just put this icing like over it on a rack like this, you see? Then you can sprinkle a little nuts like that if you want. Basically, you got to let this refrigerate, as I have right here, because then you can use the other thing here, and then that's a very simple petty for, for at home that you can make. 
See, flour is really, really important in our diet, don't you think? I'm telling you. Hey, thanks for joining me tonight, folks. I'm Emerald Lagasse. You know we love you. See you tomorrow, everybody.